today we're going to uh, talk about, uh, we're going to finish chapter 6, and then uh, we're going to uh, say a little word about uh, the formalism, right, the Dirac equation. So uh, the, the rest of chapter 6 are the uh, tight binding model, okay, which is another, which is a simple example of approximation method. And then there, you, you're going to study the uh, time dependent perturbation theory, from uh, which you can derive the famous uh, Fermi Scholder rule. And then we're going to talk about some formula. But before we get started, I want to emphasize a point that was uh, that came up in Matthew's homework. Okay. So uh, in the homework, we proved that <coughs> for a for a bound state, okay, so a bound stationary state. Because the wave function is, is purely real, we, we prove that the expectation value of P is zero. Okay. So what does this mean? If a particle is bound, there is no definition of the momentum. Okay. But nevertheless, there is still a definition of the kinetic energy. Right? And that could be defined by using the operator delta P that we defined from uh, last week's definition. This is given by the difference of Q from its uh, uh, expectation value. But for a bound state, this is simply P. Right? Right? So the kinetic energy can be defined this way. Right? And we know that the expectation of the kinetic energy then is simply the uncertainty in the momentum right? divided by two. Okay, so now if I relate this to the uncertainty principle, saying that if I'm given a wave function, this is a definite quantity. Right? This is going to be some. This is going to be of order h bar, and then there's going to be some proportionality factor here. It's called lambda. Okay. So now, given a wave function, I would know the spread in its position. Right? I uh, can roughly say where the where the particle is localized to. Okay. Once I know this through this relation, I can say that it acquires a kinetic energy. Okay. So localization of a particle so you give it kinetic energy. Okay. This this is what how kinetic energy is defined even though the particle is not moving. Okay. Now this this is one of the first things that quantum mechanics explains is why um, if you have um, Say a hydrogen like potential, which falls off as one over R, and this is a slice of it. And, they said, and it is found that um, you know, the hydrogen atom has a finite dimension so that the electron is spread out over here. But actually, if it went further, it can lower its potential energy further and further. But the, the problem is so the electron is still trying to lower its energy. But as it goes further down, it's more localized around the nucleus so that its kinetic energy due to localization becomes larger. This is why matter doesn't collapse. Okay. So this is one of the first, uh, and this is very important. Something which you re realize in your homework, hopefully. Yeah? I'm just curious, how do you get this uh, kinetic energy is the reality squared? Right, so kinetic energy is equal to g squared over 2m, right? Right, but then what for the for bound states I would just say for bound stationary states. Okay. So this is very important. And today we're going to see another um, uh, another consequence of um, this localization energy. Basically when particles spread out you save energy. Okay. But there's a restriction on how they spread out. And uh, this is illustrated by the tight binding model. And the tight binding model is a very good example of a very simple perturbation theory. Okay, so we start with the tight binding. Okay, so the tight binding model, you, you have uh, considered this uh, somewhat in your homework already. So this we study a uh, potential that looks like this. Okay. We have two uh, from wells. Okay. And then uh, 
the, the wave function in here is going to be labeled by phi, and the eigenenergy is going to be labeled by E. Okay? And then we're going to look at this, this as being assembled by two separate uh, potential wells. And we know that this wave function over here is going to look like this. We're only considering the two brown things. Okay? So let's call this phi 1. Okay? And it has an energy of E1. And then far away, there's another potential well that's identical. But we're going to label it with uh, the index 2. And it has energy E2. But one, because these are identical, we know that they're degenerate. So E1 is actually equal to E2. Okay. So now, what happens as we bring them together is uh, we're going to find out what happens. So now uh, we write down the Schrodinger equation. Okay. This is time independent form, so just the eigenvalue problem. Now, what are the what's a good approximation method that we've learned so far that we can use? We can't use the time independent perturbation theory because because of this degeneracy, right? Okay. Uh, if you did this with Tomo, you'll realize that the, the time independent perturbation theory that we learned, the non-degenerate case, re, re, <coughs> is all built upon the assumption that when well, the perturbation is very, very small, there is a definite state that the uh, that the new state is going to map to. Okay? But when you have degeneracy, any linear combination of these two can map to with the same energy. So so it doesn't work. Everything breaks down. Okay? But we can't use that. Uh, a good way uh, a good way to do this is to use uh, the subspace projection method. Okay. When do you define what it happens? Oh, I think you define what it happens. Let's, let's call this h hat over here. Okay. So the, 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 the Hamiltonian that's associated with this potential is going to be h hat. Okay. Right. So the subspace projection method, and let's, let's choose the subspace. Okay. I know that if these two are going to are going to be uh, separated, well separated, then uh, the phi one and uh, the phi one and psi two are going to be pretty good representations of the uh, wave function. You drew this in the uh, in your homework, right? Most of you drew uh, something like this. Okay, why can't we draw this? Forget about perturbation theory right now. We draw this because first of all, if I choose the uh, if I choose the origin to be here, this is an even potential. So even potential has either even or odd eigenfunction. So whatever I draw in here is going to appear here. Okay. And then and then I just start by saying, well, in, inside the well, because energy is greater than the, the potential energy, the, the wave function is going to look sinusoidal. Okay. Outside is going to look like exponential decay. Okay. So this is the first one. And then uh, the, the all solution okay, will just look like this. And I drew it so that the all solution is on top of the even solution. So I'm telling you right now that the, the all solution actually has, has higher energy. This, this is the result we're going to get. Okay. So now you see, you can see how the, these two decomposes onto these wave functions quite well. So let's just use these. So that amounts to uh, expanding phi in terms of uh, the two original functions. And let's use the uh, let's use the index a phi. Okay. So now if I plug this in up here, and I'm going to turn it into a matrix equation.
this is one side. Over here, I can most likely cross this AI because this is just a compact number. So no problem. Now, I'm not going to go ahead and say, well, this is a delta function because, because uh, this, when I bring the two wells together, right? although this is exponentially decaying, it still extends into this well. So it's not true to conclude that this is uh, already a z uh, zero unless i is equal to uh, j. So then let's let's use the uh, generalized eigenvalue problem here. So when I turn this into a matrix equation, I'm going to get this is a very simple matrix equation. It's just a two by two matrix. Right? So we're going to have h11, h12. Okay. Over here, let's just turn this into the B matrix that we used. So this is E. And then trivially, I know that the diagonals of the B matrix are going to be 1. Okay. And let me call the wave function overlap of the two, uh, slide 2, slide 1. Let's call this delta B. The delta reminds us that it's probably going to be a small quantity. Okay. And then, slide 1, slide 2. This is also a delta B. Okay. Why is that? Why don't I bother with this conjugate here? Because we have proven that in 1D okay. for a bound state, right, the wave function can be written as a real function, completely real function. So when I take the overlap between these two, there's no need to put the conjugate here. So you prove that in your homework. Okay. okay, so the task then is to solve for the eigenvalue and the eigenvector. Right? But this is extremely simple. You just bring this over here. Bring this over here and you get
So if I replace this with E1 over here, okay, then the error I get is going to be a second order, uh, a second order small value because I'm, I'm multiplying delta U with delta V and both are still very small. So I can make this replacement here. Okay. So basically I would get V is approximately equal to okay, E1 plus minus delta U minus delta V. Okay. And that now let me label this with plus minus. Okay. Is everybody okay with this step? You may want to explain more carefully why H11 is E1, H22 oh. is E1. Okay, so uh, <coughs> I mean, when I compute H11, it turns out to just be the excitation value of the energy for the first item, which is E1. And then similarly, the other one is E2, but since E1 is E2, so it, it is the same. All right, so now we know this. Let's find the uh, item vectors associated with the E plus and E minus. Okay. So now if I plug this up into here, right, and let's, let's call this, let's call this some, some parameter. This is too long. Let's call this, uh, what's it, uh, beta. And beta is something I'm going to use. All right. So when I plug this in here, and I'm going to find the uh, for E plus is equal to E1 plus beta. The associated eigenvector is going to look like, plug it into there. OK, and E1 minus E, E1 cancel with minus beta. And this one, if we still do the same replacement, if we replace E1 over here, this is going to be beta. Okay. So I'm assuming everybody knows how to solve for the eigenvector now. Right? You multiply it out and then you find the relation between uh, A1 and A2. You're going to find one relation. What's the other relation between A1 and A2? You're going to need two relations to, uh, to identify both of them. What's the other relation between A1 and A2? Yeah, normalization. So trivially, this turns out A1 is equal to A2. Okay. And plus normalization, we're going to get that. The new eigenvector, psi plus, I label it as plus because this corresponds to plus I can. Okay, is equal to 1 over square root of 2. Okay, so the, 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 the eigenvector that corresponds to the plus eigenvalue, and the plus eigenvalue, not necessarily the positive one, uh, is an even combination of the two functions. So, so it turns out it's going to be the lower energy state, and later we'll show that beta is actually negative. Okay. So now, the other one, okay, E minus is equal to E1 minus beta. If I plug that in, I get beta, beta. Okay. And what is this eigenvector? It is just, it's the odd combination of psi 1 and psi 2. Okay. And this corresponds to the minus eigenvector. So now something seems wrong. If, if beta was, was a positive value, then uh, we would have that this eta function has a greater energy than the alpha function. So, so let's see what's, what is the uh, what is the uh, sign of beta. Okay. So now we're going to do another approximation. This is the real type binding approximation. Basically, we're going to say, what does type binding mean? It means after mixing, okay, this wave function is still mostly localized to within this well. Okay. This wave function is mostly localized within the other well, so they don't overlap. So delta B is going to be zero. Right. So over here, we're more stringent than the actual type binding approximation. 
So let's let's approximate. We know that this conjugation doesn't weigh because weight functions are all real. Okay, so now this let's let's work on this integration limit first here. We know that because they don't overlap much, we don't have to do an integral over all of x. So so where do we need to do this? Let's define some composition here. I call this to be the zero of the origin. Let's call this minus b and this point minus a, this point a and this point b. Okay? So now, because of that evenness of the potential, when I evaluate this, I can evaluate it in the first well or the second well. Okay? And since we're operating on phi 2, let's do it in the uh, second well. Right? Second well over here. So that integral reduces to an uh, integral over a and b. Okay. So approximately, this is equal to integral from a to b dx. Okay. Now phi 1, it's very small here, but we're, we're, we're going to not make it 0. Now there's a problem of b of x. Let's, let's just make it very simple. Let's set the potential inside. Let's set the potential inside to zero okay. over here. So we don't have to evaluate that part. Okay. So we're just left with something that looks like this. And how do we tell the sign of such a factor? First of all, the, the way we've chosen our wave function, okay, phi 1 and phi 2 are both positive and real, right? As I said, there's one over there. Okay, so now we're, we're evaluating this inside the well, okay? What do we know about the second derivative of the wave function, of that wave function inside the well? We write down the Schrodinger equation, right? Multiply by their overlap, but we're assuming them to be zero. 
you can do that for this because this one is going to bring up, bring down the, the variation of this function twice. So that might be bigger than this. Okay. So let me go ahead and choose a scale so that the zero of energy is up here. Okay. Then our energy eigenvalues are negative. Right. Right. Is that correct? Okay. So if the energy eigenvalues are negative, that means that means c squared dx squared minus a. Yeah. According to Schrodinger equation, you know, this is equal to a negative number times the wave function, which we have assumed to be real and positive. Okay. So this expectation here is a negative number. So beta is less than zero in the time finding approximation. And you see that, you see the problem here. We have to do this because it's only an approximation. Okay. So I'm going to say that delta E is less than zero. Okay. With delta E less than zero, then that, that drawing makes sense because you know, the phi plus corresponds to E1 minus delta E, minus the magnitude. So let me write this out. The result of the type binding approximation is okay, so we get a new eigenvector that is an even superposition of the two old ones. Okay. And the eigenvalue is equal to C1 minus the absolute value of delta. And then there's also an odd one with a raise of the other. Okay. So the time binding approximation says that. By putting these two wells together, we have lifted the degeneracy. Right? Before they were degenerate, but when I put them together, they're going to couple. Okay? And the coupling lifts the degeneracy. So let me write this here. Okay, so this is E1. And then after coupling, it goes to uh, E minus and then E plus. Okay? And the, these, the separation here is 2 delta. Okay. And this is quite a general result. This happens a lot. Okay. So now, and I ask you to think about this in your homework as well. Okay. Now what happens if if I have two wells that originally separated far apart? Okay. And now they are now they can share a particle. There is a particle localized to one of the wells initially. So let me draw the situation for you. Okay, so we have a well here. And then far away, there is a well here. And then there's a particle in the ground state over here. Okay. Now well, what does quantum mechanics tell us? Tell us okay. It says that so long as this, this distance is finite, when I solve the Schrodinger equation, I actually need to include two pieces in here. Right? There's going to be an exponentially decaying solution. But so long as this is finite, the exponentially growing one is normal eigenvalue. Right? So the wave function is going to sense this well over here. Okay? So it's going to start mixing with the ground state over here. Okay? And uh, as the strength of the coupling is increased, meaning that we increase delta E, you see that by going into the ground state of this combined uh, well, okay, there's a saving of energy. Right? So this particle, the action of this particle, is going to tend to attract the two wells. Right? Okay. So you see that by sharing a particle, two, two kind of wells can attract. And we haven't assumed any kind of interaction yet. There's no charge anywhere, okay. 
But of course, well, if there's no charge, what is this well? This well will probably come up from some kind of charge. But the point is, without well, without any of them being being charged, okay, there's going to be not to be a, a, a electrical interaction between the two wells. Simply by that they can share a particle, they will attract each other. So this kind of interaction is actually more fundamental than, than interaction with a charge. And there is a there is a way to interpret uh, Coulomb interaction like this by sharing a photon. Uh, but it's not the photon that we really use to. So anyways, this is this is a really important result. Okay? When two two quantum wells can share a particle, they tend to attract each other. This is what this is the Basic model for covalent bonding. Okay, and this, over here you see you see a uh, one uh, example also of localization energy, and this is the more general result. This is called the exchange energy. Okay. So by exchanging a particle, the two wells save energy, so they attract each other. But over here, you know, they're also sharing a particle, but in the uh, they're sharing a particle in the odd way. So what, what, what is the difference here? What causes this function, this wave function, to have more energy than this? Is? Okay. Yeah, the overlap is smaller, and actually, everything happens at the origin here. So if I were to to draw, so let's sketch this as a pencil here. If I were to draw the probability distribution for the for the particle by squaring it. For the ground state I'm going to get value over here is non-zero. It's small but it's non-zero. Okay, but for the first excited state Solid. 
and in solid state they use this a lot. They use this for an example to explain why solids form, the formation of solid. And okay, so so I want you to briefly outline how you would apply this to say studying the interaction between two atoms. Okay. This is one D, right? Because you have two atoms in three dimensions. Oh. So how how would you do it? The, the procedure is very simple. The procedure is very similar, and also when you have just two atoms, it's still a one-dimensional problem. There is still a one-dimensional problem because the you can reduce the two body. Problem. So when you have two atoms, okay. This is called a two-body problem if we disregard the internal degrees of freedom of the atom, the daily where the electrons, what the electron is doing around the nucleus. Let's say that both of the atoms are in the ground state. Okay. So now, it's quite similar to this, but there's several complications. First of all, this is a three-dimensional problem. But actually, since it's a two-body problem, okay, what we can do is we can you know, choose this axis we can reduce the two-body problem down to a 1D problem by introducing the so-called uh, reduced mass. You can change this into uh, dynamics of one particle being the center of mass, but I don't want to get into that. So this is essentially still a one-dimensional problem. The only difference here is okay, we can perfectly well model this atom with a you know, square well, okay. with a square well. Uh, but then we have two electrons. Okay. And naively, we're going, to, we're going to see that okay, if we have two electrons and the, 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 the uh, degeneracy is lifted this way, okay, the degeneracy is lifted this way, one electron goes here and another electron goes here. 